Meet Stephen Wolfram, theoretical physicist and CEO of Wolfram Research. I think he was also the third person to ever have his full genome sequenced. And he has written several books. One is uh, A New Kind of Science, and he's written many books about Mathematica, which he invented, and also uh, this book on idea makers. I sat down with him during a pause in a workshop he was giving about Mathematica, and in fact, he gave me one of these books. And then we started talking about Are We Alone? You wrote a book called A New Kind of Science, and uh, it's described in Wikipedia called it says, the universe is digital in its nature and runs on fundamental laws which can be described as a simple program. So, I'm interested in are we alone? I'm interested in the origin of life on this planet. So, what is it about your vision of a digital universe that can inform origin of life studies? Many things. So, I mean, the first question is sort of what is the raw material from which we build up our science? And we've had for the last 300 or so years, there's been kind of this idea that if you want to make an exact science, Mathematics, mathematical equations, and so on, they're your raw material. What I got interested in many years ago now was kind of, is there a generalization of that? Is there something that is, uses the idea of having a theory, but the raw material for that theory is something beyond just the traditional you know, integrals and derivatives and exponentials and so on that we see in mathematics? Mm -hmm. So the first step is to kind of understand the basic science of the computational universe. Once we've understood that, we can then take the raw material that we have from that and start using it to make conclusions and make models for things in the world, like for biochemistry and so on. Uh -huh. The interesting part of it is the intuition that you get and the very different kinds of questions that you can ask, like questions about you know, what is intelligence, what is life, what's the significance of intelligence and life, and so on. You get to really ask those questions in a much cleaner way by using this kind of different approach to building up science. I mean, I guess a case that's perhaps more interesting and that is the case of intelligence. What do we mean by intelligence? You know, there are really, there are three competing sort of sources of intelligence today. There's us and our brains, which are the one thing where we're really sure we have some kind of intelligence. Almost by definition. <laughs> yeah, right. The, um, there's the AI, the artificial intelligence mm -hmm. world, which I've been much involved in for many years, and there's the intelligence in other things in the world. So, you know, for example, one of the things that this principle of computational equivalence implies is that there's nothing really special about the computations that happen in our brains. And that means that, uh, that, that has many, many, many consequences. So for example, one consequence it has is the thing I call computational irreducibility. When you look at a system, one of these abstract systems evolving, a system in nature evolving, it operates according to some rules. And there's the question of whether our brains, with all of our intelligence, can kind of decode what's happening in the system. And even though the system itself is taking, is going through a million steps to get to the outcome, mm -hmm. whether our brains, by being smarter, by being more intelligent, can somehow jump ahead and just say, oh, I know what's going to happen after a million steps. I don't have to wait and watch the thing go a million steps. I just know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact this phenomenon of computational irreducibility says that can't happen. In other words, that there are many, many systems that reach this threshold of computational equivalence and which have the property that there's really no, uh, th there's no way to jump ahead. They're all equivalent in the kind of computational process that they're going through. I think that the, um, uh, I think we're more robust than people sometimes give us credit for. And I think the, um, uh, um, you know, when I was a kid, right, the Cold War was, at, you know, was, was hot, so to speak. And uh, you know, that was the time when everybody thought in the Drake Equation, you know, the term that says the lifetime of a technological civilization yeah. was going to be 100 years because yes, everybody would blow themselves up with nukes. It yes. um, didn't happen. Uh, you know, my, my feeling is, the, um, uh, you know, is there a necessary expiration date? There is in some sense because the, you know, one thing we will achieve for sure is, is some form of immortality, at which point the nature of our civilization will change considerably because a lot of human activities are driven by, you know, finite lifespan right. and scarce resources and things like this. You know, I, I feel like there's an evolution of human purposes which is where sort of almost tautologically we conclude that what we're doing is worthwhile 
because that's what we're doing. Mm. Uh, you know, that's what we have, and that's what we might as well be, be, uh, be involved with.